Hello and welcome to episode 261 of the 77 Club. Harry, start with the socials. That is the Wolf 77 Club on all social media. Apart from on X, we're at 77 Club Podcast. We're also on Spotify, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify and YouTube. Uh, the regular Jack Williams is here. I'm not ready to start calling it X yet, so it's still Twitter, but hello. <laughs> Formerly Twitter. And uh, a newcomer to the podcast, uh, I'd like to welcome Daniel Bayliss. Uh, Dan, uh, I don't know if you've been on before. When was the last time you were on? About, uh, who was Prime Minister? Ago. Yeah, okay. Well, that could be anyone's guess. <laughs> that could have been not very long ago. Uh, excellent, good to have you back. Um, Harry, let's start with Villa. We want to set the scene, if you can, please. Uh, your day started pretty early, half five kickoff at Villa Park, um, but you were in the pub early doors. Uh, went too bad, actually. I got to train off about midday with Jack's crew. Um, those that don't know, can we get in trouble for this? I had Jack's ticket, who cares? Sack me, I'm bothered. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, went up with old uh, Bully, Fez and that, uh, Dale. And yeah, I got to train up had a few beers. There's a few pyros and that going off in a few of the pubs we went in, but we just left. I think, did you see that? All the orange, what's it called? The orange gas? Yeah, yeah, uh, flares. Someone, a flare. Yeah. A flare, yeah, pyro. Um, and then, as we know, got into the ground and it all went downhill from there. Do you know what? It was, a great, it was great on the train on the way in, into Witten Station. Really good banter between the Villa and the Wolves fans. No trouble. But a lot of songs going back and forth. That's probably the highlight of the day, to be honest. That was when I thought we were going to win. But then obviously back to reality when the game kicks off. I, I know we're sort of I'm, I'm starting at the end. Have I gone again? Am I gone? No, no he, he went. did. Oh, Harry's gone. Right, okay, sorry. Just, just like Mike drop a suit the second he finished talking, he just cut out. <laughs> I, I don't want to start at the end, but there was a, a great chant. I think it was on the platform to go home. And... The song was obviously from the Villa fans of, of Mind the Gap. Mind the, mind the Gap. Uh, and then the Wolves fans singing back, Mind the Cash, Mind the Cash, Aston Villa. There's a points deduction on the way, which I thought was an in- incredible <laughs> song. So I want to start on a positive. Uh, but Jack, I'll come to you now. Really, really strange start in 11 from Wolves, I think, just because nobody called it, nobody expected it. A little bit of a mish- mishmash, no one really knew what was going on, I don't think, in the in the build-up to this. But uh, start for Chiwome. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's it's kind of, there had to be somebody who played, who, you know, particularly in that upfront role, who was uh, going to be going to be uh, a young and unproven player. Um, but yeah, he obviously, it's it's one of them really, isn't it? He obviously was fancied over, over Fraser, playing that leading role. Um, and, you know, overall, I think, didn't do too badly. Um, I think we can we can come on to the way the game. Like, the, the game started, I thought we started well. Like, I was really pleased yeah. with the way we started. And to be honest, like, I, I didn't really see it coming. And it's one of those where they, they were digging in. We were had the better of the ball. And I think, really, what, what happens, particularly going away against Villa when we've got barely any players and with the, with the bare bones is we're going to have to perform and we're going to have to take our chances. And we ha- we didn't like create many chances, but we had a golden one, which obviously fell to eight Nori before Villa went ahead. And we've got to, we've got to be converting that, haven't we? And if we had, it, it could have been a very different game. But I think from that point on, Villa just slowly started to turn the screw a little bit. And once they went in front, it was always going to be a difficult, a difficult battle to get back into the game, particularly when you're looking at like both teams' benches and who they can bring on. And their subs did come on and make an impact for when they they eventually went and got the second goal. So it you know, we put up a decent fight with what was available. Um, it's really annoying that we couldn't go in front, but uh, but you know, I wasn't I think it's kind of went as expected, but when you asked me last week, I said we were going to lose 4-0 and it was nowhere near that bad. I think, Harry, you said 2-0, didn't you, in the end? But it, it, it's just a case, again, I think, of like they're doing their best given what we've got available. But when you, you think think in that game, there was you know, three 19, 20-year-olds had to feature and play a part in, the, in that game. And that's that's not going to win you much in the Premier League, is it really? But you, you know, you've know, got to give them credit because they did, they did okay considering. Uh, but it's just it's just annoying, really, that we couldn't go to Villa with a full shred team because I think it would have been a you know a different game. But at the same time, Villa fans have been saying that they've had injuries as well. But I think they've got the strength and depth to cover with it a bit more. Whereas basically, our entire front line, which has been so successful this season, has just been ripped out of us, and mm-hmm. we're going to struggle, aren't we? Uh, Danny, it was a strange one. Edge in possession, uh, more shots, although fewer on target. Um, 
but yeah, I think we all said the same thing. You know, as soon as it gets to around that 60 minute mark, you're thinking they're probably going to start to get a bit leggy. And as Jack and Harry have said, you know, we just haven't got the strength and depth to be able to do like for like swaps that are going to be fresh legs with the same quality. Yeah, we're just a bit thin and a bit toothless, to be honest. Um, they've played us at a good time and a bad time for us. We, you know, we've had these bad injuries, but that's our fault for having a small squad. But when you look at Villa, I think they're sixth or seventh in the highest wage bill in the league. Um, they've they've got the bodies in, but that's why they're in the position they're in, right? That's why they're fourth. Um, so fair play to them if they avoid the points deduction for that one. It's um. You know, we were lauding it a couple of years ago when we spent big and finished higher up the table than them, and just just wasn't Wolves' day. You know, eight Nori should really have had two goals from two foot in two games, and he's come away with one. Um, so it's disappointing, but sort of expected given what's happened over the last few months. So I'm not overly down about it. It's just frustrating from our perspective, and then it's obviously frustrating from O'Neill's perspective. Um, Harry, we were obviously going to talk about how smaller squad is and obviously the, the post-match comments from Gary O'Neill after the Burnley game, which we will move on to. But I just want to raise it with you a little bit now. Um, you, you've put as a title, Jeff Shee ignored O'Neill's warning about the small squad at Wolves. Um, Mr. Wharton Wolf says, no sympathy for Gary O'Neill. He was quick enough to back the club's approach when he joined back in August. Now he's raising exactly the same concerns as Locke Bottega made. And he was critical of. Just your thoughts on that? Yeah, and <clears throat> I think someone put on social media earlier as well, like a quote from every manager, like the last four managers saying the same thing, isn't it? Saying yeah. they've been promised bodies, but they haven't got it. Uh, Lopetegui was probably the most outspoken about it, and obviously had a, clearly had a big falling out with Jeff Shee. But I think the difference is with this season is we kind of knew what the objective was, which was to stay up. Jeff was very honest in his open letter, saying we've got to be a team that uh, should have the underdog mentality that we've just been promoted, which Wolves fans don't want to hear. But I think they kind of got a bit of credit in the bank when Everton and uh, Forrest got their charges. But it's got to change because they've got to... Sh Look, they've been brilliant. They've been absolutely brilliant for us, folks, and they've took us to you know to where we are. But there is another level we've got to try and get to now. So it'll be boring. And eventually we will go down if we keep doing what we're doing. I know Jeff's got this obsession with having a small squad and bringing youth players through. But right now, it's proven... It's proven that it don't work because of Ch Chiroma, Chirawi, Fraser, when they come in, it's just night and day. Like the, the quality difference at, the, at that age is just not there, is it? Fabio Silva's on a one, really, as well. But yeah, the, the Villa game, just quickly before we move on from it as well, I, I actually thought, you know, like the first half hour we were pretty good. And the thing is, under Gary O'Neill, obviously our hands are tied. The effort we put in, they all put effort in. And even against Coventry, I know we lost. Obviously, we're going to the Burnley game, but they always put in 100%. And under Bruno Large, towards the end of that season, where we like beat it away and we had a small squad, the players just didn't give a shit, did they, if you remember? But that's the big difference. And yeah, it's a bit of a surprise now that Gary O'Neill has decided to come out now and say what he's saying. But he's got a lot of credit in the bank. All the blame does go to Jeff and that. But it's a weird one, as I say, because we you know this is like a weird season where we was uh, expecting it. And things have got to change. And hopefully... Because obviously Cunha is, is back now. That was a big surprise, actually. Everyone thought Cunha would be on the bench for Villa, and he wasn't. And that was a bit of a dampener going into it as well, him not being available at all. And yeah, and uh, we lose, and we are where we are. But it's a weird one, isn't it? It's a, it's a bit a bit of a debate, and it's splitting the fan base about this topic. Harry, I've got a bit of a point on that, because we're clearly going through cycles, right? The end of the Nuno era, where we weren't great. And then we've gone through that sort of year and a half spell where we haven't, we bought, we haven't bought well when we've had the opportunity to buy and we have spent money. And that was because of sellers and poor managerial choices and that put us in a pickle financially. This next coming six months is the point where O'Neill can prove... He's proved himself on the pitch now. There's no doubters. We've got a change in management behind the scenes in Hobbs, who's clearly brought in good players at low cost when he has. And now we're getting to the point where we might be able to spend some money again. So although we've got that doom and gloom of having a small squad, it's because we haven't bought that well and we've sold reasonably badly. You know, yes, Matinho came to the end of his run. Neves went for big money. And then there's been a string of really poor purchases. I mean, we could keep going forever on the Guedes. I mean, we could go around all day talking about the, the bad players at big money that we've bought. So. 
this is now the opportunity with a clean slate, with a reset FFP for O'Neill to actually stamp his thing. So this summer, this is the time for Foson to put a push up. If they do want the club to progress, we've clearly got a good manager. It clearly looks good behind the scenes. The players want to play for the manager and the club. So it's only going to take a handful of very good signings. Wolves go to the next level. And we're doing that from a position of eighth with a game in hand on West Ham this coming weekend. So, yes, there are some naysayers and the comments are blowing up and Twitter's been a shitstorm the last 48 hours. But I think you've got to look on it positively. This was, as everyone's just said, a survival season. And look how well we've done. Sorry, I know I've gone on a proper rant there. No, 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 no. Um, but Martin says it, it's the board and especially Jeff. Neil says the only way to progress is to be bought by a country. Um, James <laughs> says we are where we are, three points off Europe. Uh, Stephen says perhaps O'Neill knows what is coming this summer, namely no further investment. Stu says, what's with all the doom and gloom? We're one of the favourites to go down to achieve what we've done so far this season. We've overachieved. The summer won't be defined by how much we spend, but how we spend it, which sort of goes back mm-hmm. to that. Um, Newport Wall says, if Gary O'Neill gets what he wants, who goes and comes in next season? Um, James again says the poor purchases were all under large, in fairness. I, I take the point, and go, and go back to Dan's point, you know, I think we have, we've spent badly. I think you can take any Premier League club and pick out some duck eggs and, and expensive ones yeah. at that. And it, it doesn't matter what club they're at. It's just that we obviously give them a little bit more scrutiny compared to to other people. I mean, you know, we're living in a world at the moment where Roy Keane calls Erling Haaland a, a League Two standard striker, which is just utterly ridiculous. Which is common the weekend, yeah, because of his movements off the ball. Um, but Jack, what, what what are your thoughts? Because if you if you've got one pundit who, by the way, you know, played for Manchester United, captain Manchester United, won a lot of silverware in Manchester United, he's having to go at Man City play, you probably think, well, actually, it probably comes with the territory. But you know, we are in a world where everything is looked at in such minutiae, in the minutiae, um, that you know, you're going to have these conversations. Yeah, firstly, I think if Wolves were bought by a country, it would be San Marino, no, no, look. Um, <laughs> but, um, um, so, yeah, I, th- I think it's got something to do with yeah. what we spoke about on the podcast last time. And it's just when you think about the amount of forward players we've got who we're still paying in some form part of their wages for. When you met- Dan mentioned Guedes earlier and you've got Podence, you've got Fabio, you've got Kalajkic's. I think the board were, you know, reluctant to bring in more forward players, um, particularly when everything was going well, and essentially just to be there as backup because of the amount of money they've probably still got as outgoings um, on those players while keeping an eye on financial fair play. I, I do sympathise with O'Neill though because it sounded like that he was he was told there was going to be someone brought in, and we said it all along. You can't let. Even if it's Kladjic, Kladjic and for Fabio, I still can't say his name properly. Kladjic. Just say Sasha. Like, yeah, I'll just say Sasha. It's easier. But you can't lose knows. two. You can't mm. lose two first team strikers and just not replace them and think everything's going to be okay. I don't care if they're not actually starting; they're still in and around the team. So I, I fully appreciate his frustration there because like we're seeing it in black and white now, just with the team selections. And it's a case of oh, which nineteen year old are we going to play up front now against? away against a really good Premier League team when they've got seven senior appearances between them. It's like, you're just asking for trouble, aren't you? So I, I think, like, I sympathise with Gary O'Neill, but I also sympathise with, with you know, with the players and everything going on there because I I, I, I thought we were going to lose to Villa on Saturday. Ultimately, we did. But the fact we, sh- we just put up a bit of fight under those circumstances means it wasn't too heartbreaking as, like, other defeats would have been under different circumstances. So I, I, I think... Gary O'Neill's earned earned our respect. And when he came in, he didn't have that at all. On this podcast, mm-hmm. let's be honest, we slagged him off um, quite a lot. Even, yeah. even at the start, we were calling him Mr. O'Neill for, for the first like two months of the <laughs> season. Was, I remember which that looking one. which looking back now was just was just a bit <laughs> silly and a bit childish, but you know. And I think he's earned the right now, given what he's got out of the players, and he's still getting performances out of the players in difficult circumstances. That the fact he's come out and said this, we need to listen to him. And we can't let it be a mistake that just continues to happen under successive seasons and successive managers. It has to be something that's addressed. So, I, again, with, with what Dan said, clear out the deadwood in the summer, 
cut your losses, just get them off the wage bill, whatever it might be, whatever it takes, and have an actual crack at it. But you need to make sure you've got at least one backup for every position that you want to play in, you know, and, and other players who can cover in other positions. Um, and we need to make sure that that's it. We need we need a squad of like 20 players who can come in comfortably and, you know, be in the first team and stay fit, you know, to be honest. Uh, Harry, I think the, the, the one thing, uh, I know we're sort of skipping over Burnley a little bit with the, with the conversation here, but just to keep the flow, um, the, the one thing that Gary O'Neill said, which I, I thought was quite telling, was when he said that they had a Premier League striker ready to come in, but we couldn't afford that little bit of money. And I don't know what a little bit of money is when it comes to Premier League, pr- you guess, proven strikers, but mm. then are they really that great if they're a little bit money? Is it a loan fee that is most likely that, that we couldn't afford or Jeff Shee was out of the country or some some bollocks like is I can't turn on his phone or something or I don't know, send a fax. It depends how far you want to go back. Um, did, did you think that was quite telling that, you know, that there, there really is no money? Yeah, I think that the, the player was Broha, wasn't it? That Broja, the one who went to Fulham because he was going to be like a loan and you had to pay a bit of a fee. It was on about him. Yeah, it is telling. But I, I agree with what Jack said. I think Jeff just gambled. We were in a great position. He just was hoping we wouldn't get all these injuries. And as Gary O'Neill said, because he sees them day in, day out in training, he knew the overload. He, and you have to use the same players all the time. That the intensity we play at on the counter and the high press we were doing, we were always going to get injuries. And it's happened. We we called it, didn't we? I think not just us, all Wolves fans called it. You could see it a mile off, but Jeff's quite, uh, he's got his ways. He's just got to try and change his ways, hasn't he? And he's got to be in the That's country if we do want to find players. <laughs> uh, Harry, it's just a bit sad that accountants now run football and it's not like everyone's being given an amount of money to go and spend and it's like a draft it's that the big clubs get to spend more money and the smaller clubs get to spend less money and that's what the accountants say and if you don't play by their rules we'll take your points off you it was a quiet january window wasn't it i mean it they say it's the door slam shut but it's all just did a little fire escape look at look at the start of the season right if we'd have been in the position that everyone thought right down the bottom scrapping for our lives and we'd have tried to spend 10 20 million on a player and then been floating around 16th and then had a six point deduction we'd have been knackered but so, what frustrates me Bayless, what frustrates me is if we'd have got to this january and we were 18th struggling they would have spent some money like they did under lopetegui in january well, so they, they did it last Big year gamble. It frustrates me because why not if that is the case, which I believe is, why not spend a little bit, just getting a little bit of backup? Because we are literally in touching distance of Europe. It was the same under Bruno Large, and they wouldn't do it, and they won't do it again. Because the reality is, Jeff Shee said in one of his recent Ash Wall things, is we can't compete with the top six financially. So he don't want to take the gamble. He don't want to take the risk, which it's up to him. It's his money. Well, it's not his. It's the higher ups who he works for his money. And they just want to keep us sustainable. And I think they'd be happy with us being in mid-table Premier League club, which is good. I mean, we'd have dreamed of it 10 years ago, but it does get to a point you want a bit more ambition, don't you? Just naturally, as a football fan, if you stay... I mean, I remember Albion and under Pulis, they finished eighth, didn't they? And they weren't happy. All clubs do it. Stoke. You want to try and progress. And then eventually, you just go down. You just don't. You ain't going to maintain mid-table for five more years, I don't think. It always happens. The club, Charlton back in the day, there's so many clubs you can give an example as. Yeah. Eventually, it shoots you in the foot. Yeah. I, I, the, the trajectory is usually down rather than up, isn't it? And you see these teams who do that, like you say, they're comfortably mid-table, comfortably established, and it only, it only takes one season. I mean, with the exception of the, the big six and Everton, and Everton have been flirting with it for years now. It will happen eventually. I'm pretty pretty sure of that. It's it's going to happen at some point. I think it probably would be happening now if the three that came up weren't just so off the pace <laughs> that it's yeah, kind of even, uh, kind even of helped, Villa, but... Southampton, Newcastle, West Ham. I mean, they, they've yeah, they've all gone down yeah, in recent Newcastle years, went, haven't yeah. they? So mm-hmm. they've all gone down in recent years, and it doesn't mean to say you can't go down and have a season or 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 a few seasons in the championship and come up and compete. Uh, but uh, you know, to actually stay there continuously, you do need that extra, that massive amount of money. And I think that's the reason, really, that the only teams that have never gone down from the Premier League are those really those, those bigger clubs, massive clubs. It, should we say? It, it does come down to recruitment as well. And actually, if you look at over the last sort of five, six seasons, you know, teams like Brighton. Villa now as well, who've come on that trajectory where they, they've come up and then they, they've just kept going and going and going. I mean, Brighton are a very good example at the moment because they've just published their accounts and they're the most profitable club, I think. Well, one of the most profitable in the world and certainly the most profitable in England at the moment. 
But if even if you take out the what I would call inflated transfer fees that they receive for people like Caicedo, uh, McAllister, and not that they're poor players, but I think there's a lot of money for obviously what they paid for them in the first place. That they're, they're still in profit, so it's not the case of you know they sold someone for a hundred million quid and and that's what's pushed them uh, into the positive finances. If you take even take away the big player sales, they're still they're still doing it because they've been run properly since two thousand and seven. Obviously, a, a long term um, planning. But well, you have to be lucky, don't you? Because you know at the yeah. end of the day, they they snuck in Neil. To Newcastle. Neil's just put Leicester Premier League winners now in the Championship. I'd take that all day. If Wolves won the Premier League, then won the FA Cup no, a year or so later, relegate me. Yes, I would. The Premier League, Sam. If someone <laughs> said Wolves are going to win the Premier League next year, but then get relegated two years later, I'm like, all right, we'll bounce back up eventually. Uh, Come on, that the well. 100%. And the FA Cup. And, we've, like, we've been and then they won the FA Cup. Like, but just on Villa as well, obviously I know we've gone over that game already. We, I envy Villa a bit. That's where Wolves want to be. We want to do what Villa have done. Don't we? We want to get. We want to. You know, they've spent well. They've got a good manager in. All we're missing is spending well, really. And look at Burnley. I know we're going to speak about Burnley in a minute. At the game, they were mid-table for Asian to Dice, and they petered away and went down. They're trying to change the system, but it's just it's, it's just fine balance in it. And I don't, I don't know if Jeff can get it right because if we keep going the way we're going, we're going to get caught out. I know we're repeating ourselves a bit now, but do you want to talk about Burnley? I don't know. <laughs> well, yeah, we can talk about we? Burnley. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll I'll start with you then, Bayliss. Uh, as you as you put your hand up. Um, there was a little bit of confusion as to what formation we were playing. I mean, some outlets had Doherty on the right. Jack, I think you said, is he playing at centre back? What, what what's going on? Um, Eight Nori was playing on the left hand side. Chuomi up front, Sarabia behind him. It was it was all a, a little bit all over the place. But I think it comes down to the point that we've just been talking about for the last fifteen minutes is that we have got the players that to play the formation that he clearly wants to play away to a struggling side who are grappling for every single point. Yeah, I thought Burnley did well. I thought they created the better chances. Saar kept in the game. We didn't take our chances, especially first half. I thought we were quite poor. Um, yeah, we haven't got a solid defence at the moment, have we? And that's what led to the goal because they got cross wires and two of them marked the same bloke. And uh, did well to get out of there with a point in the end, even though Lamina should have really won it for us and Ait Nori should have probably got the other one. But I, Saar made better saves than the chances we hadn't missed. Jack, mm. bring you in that. Yeah, I mean, about it was just the, the formation. It was our choice to sort of line up like that at the back, wasn't it? Which uh, Santi Bueno being dropped was a bit a bit surprised by, to be honest. I, I don't think that's necessarily justified, but obviously with the change in, change in formation, um, they picked up a little bit lately, haven't they, Burnley? So, you know, it's not just a case of, um, you know, them being doomed relegation fodder that... Um, that we should just be turning over. And as we know, Wolves never seem to do that anyway, no matter who it is. We we do give give points to the uh, so-called lesser teams and they're fighting for their lives now. They really needed wins. And I think particularly um, particularly with that show towards the end of the game, because they were coming at it more than us, it looked like we were happy to, to set off with a point, which is, is frustrating to, to Wolves fans. But uh, again, it's like, it's what we can do with the tools we've got. But I think up until when we scored at the very, very end of the first half, we looked poor. We looked like going forward, like that. it was just, it was slow. The decision-making was bad. It felt like times like they didn't want to pass to certain members of the team. And they, they were had the, they, like I'm just naming a few names here, but I think Sarabia and Bueno, there was a couple of times where they either just played the right pass and pl- played it terribly or just, mm-hmm played the wrong pass entirely and it broke the move down. It happened on a few occasions and it, it was a painful watch that first half. And I think Burnley, to, to their credit, they deserve to, to be 1-0 up. And then we just sort of, you know, relied on um, relied on our, our, our man at the moment, Aitnori, Nori, to, to get us out of jail. And he, he could have got us out of the jail with a win, really, because he had that great chance in the second half. But yeah, it picked up a little bit. Um, but but yeah, it was, it was a concerning watch the first half. But, you know, I, I think by the end of it, most Wolves fans were kind of, content with a point even though we had chances to win it but Burnley will be going home looking at that saying that's a game that they should have won on the balance of play and they've got a case for it to be fair. Uh, Harry I think you made the point with Chiwomi and, and I was watching the game and thinking that he was playing playing well and you know was was holding up the ball he was chasing lost causes which you don't really get uh, a lot of the time um, I, I don't think he really put a foot wrong but it, there seemed to be this thing where you know a Wolves player would look up see it was him and then turn around and pass it backwards. 
Yeah, they were all avoiding him, especially Sarabia. Sarabia didn't want to pass to him at all. Um, Eight Nori was the same. Hugo Bueno had a really bad game. Really yeah. bad. He was so bad down the left for me. I was glad when he went off. We are literally at the moment, with that team that started, a one-man team, and it's Eight Nori. <laughs> we were just literally relying on him. Samedo made a few really good runs as well down the right-hand side. Um, and obviously, he was at fault. I blame Samedo for their first goal. But Chiromi, it's one of them. It's uh, He's a young, really young lad. He's not very strong, is he? So their defenders was bullying him. Um, he couldn't... I, I thought he was poor, to be honest. Some would disagree. But it's not his fault, is it? And as I say, they just didn't want to pass to him. They see him in training. They, you know, they know his uh, ability at the moment. And we had nothing up there. It weren't sticking. And uh, well, I was that goal, just... I mean, that equaliser just come out of nowhere. Because Sarabia... He's got no pace, so when he's on the ball, you want him to be making the right decisions using his like ability, his passing ability. But apart from the cross he put in off the free kick, which was a really good delivery, everything else he did was horrendous. Um, Gomez and Lamina were a bit sloppy as well for me. Um, yeah, and he was just poor. And I thought uh, Hillman had a bit of a better game than he did against Villa. But it was, uh, if it were for Jose Sarr, agree with Bayless, especially second half, we would have lost that game because he pulled off three or four. Crucial saves, eight Nori, and uh, as you mentioned, Lamina should have won it. But as Jack mentioned, really good point. They drew 2 2 with Chelsea with 10 men their last game. Really good result. I mean, I, I don't think they'd lost in three. So the fact that we battled away and got that draw away at Burnley, yes, they've struggled this season, but I think it's a really good result considering we played quite poorly and considering the situation we're in and we're playing like this weird 4 4 1 1 with Doherty right midfield. You can't believe it when you say it out loud, but that's the situation we're in. And the character shone through and we could have nicked it on another day. And talking about things you can't believe, Bayliss, I think that matches the points total from last season with eight games to spare, which obviously shows that the sort of season we had. And a lot of people are saying that, you know, it's potentially going to peter out and then be a shame. And, but obviously back to the goal, I saw a lot of Burnley fans were getting salty saying that mm. it, it wasn't a foul in the first place to give the ball away. Uh, company, I think, came out and said that um, eight Nori had tried to pirouette and tripped over himself. And that's why they weren't really very happy with it. I mean, how did you see it? Theirs came from a soft foul as well. Yeah, exactly. Swings and roundabouts. Oh. Oh. Those get given against us all the time. All the time you see a player feel a tiny bit of contact go down, free kick. So it's just one in our favour for a change. It's weird, wasn't it, Jack? We talk about VAR a lot, but it's one of those instances where... We've seen it against us, you know, plenty of times where we, we've scored a goal, but there's been a foul in the build-up. Um, I suppose it's a little bit of an opposite, really. Of, do you think it's a foul in the build-up to this? Yes or no, and then scoring from the free kick. It, it seems just like another highlight of the rules not really working 100 percent of the time to me. It's just an example of them. They forced it on us. They want to bring it in, but now because of all the negativity, they don't want to bring it in too much. And if you're then reviewing the fouls for the free kick, which led to the goal, it's just going to wind everybody up more and take mm. longer. So they, they can't touch these sort of things, really. To be honest, I didn't think it was a foul. I think it was soft. I think uh, we were quite lucky to get it. But once you've got it, you've still got to put a good ball in. And, you know, Burnley switched off a little bit, didn't they, really? Um, if they, they should know that eight Nora is our only goal threat at the moment. And they chose, <laughs> chose not to bother marking him, really. They, should have, they could have left some of the other ones well alone. So, you, you know... He took it well, did well to get back into it, but um, yeah, it's a you know it's a shame that we couldn't nick it. But I think it would have been a bit harsh on Burnley if we did. But that eight Nori chance in, in the uh, first that in the second half, the eight Nori chance because Harry, bet, yeah. you, you, Harry had had a bet on uh, eight Nori to score uh, two or more goals, and it was quite tasty odds, wasn't it, Harry? So uh, eighty to one, <laughs> eighty to one. So you cursed him. He was he was cursed, kiss of death then. But um, I think he's right. I I nearly volleyed the telly off the stand when he missed that. <laughs> I think it was right to take the shot on, but if you watch it back, he does do a little glance up to Chiwome. And then he still takes the shot. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's, still that's a prime example. Like, I see him. Yeah, if that was, <laughs> yeah, was Cunha stood there, he's laying that across. There's no doubt I, about I, it. I agree. I agree. It was literally, yeah. it was a carbon copy of the Villa one. He probably had a bit more space and time for the Villa one, but he just hit straight at the keeper's chest. Yeah. Anywhere either side, it's a goal. <laughs> It was funny. I thought the Wolves fans did very well making the trip. Um, lots of numbers, very loud, uh, raising the roof, although it looks like they didn't need to because it was falling down in the, in the first yeah, half. Yeah, what was, was A bunch of fans got moved because it was at the uh, Jimmy McElroy stand. Um, so <laughs> supporters were moved Jimmy from a section McElroy. of that stand. 
uh, over safety concerns about the stadium's roof, a piece of metal could be seen hanging from the stands <laughs> roof above supporters. It's a shit ground, though, isn't it? I mean, let's be honest. I mean, how is you look at the Premier League grounds and you think, what? Well, you got Luton. The vitality is okay, but it's tiny. And then you've got places like Turf Moor and just like it's meant to be the best league in the world. It's, it is literally falling down. We, we've got comments in the comment section talking about Molyneux being beyond repair. But I mean, Bayless, at least there's not a piece of metal hanging from the Steve Ball, for example. <laughs> for all we know, there might be. Well, that's true. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, it isn't in the best of Nick. Um, oh, I've got nothing to say about it. I'll only get myself in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> All oh, right, okay. Uh, let, let's move on to uh, West Ham. It is, uh, as Jack said before we started recording, uh, the Claret and Blue podcast. So um, welcome them to Molyneux next. Um, Harry, some potentially good news on the horizon was that obviously Cunha uh, back in action against Burnley. And there is a 50-50 chance that uh, Huang and Dawson. Uh, Dawson may be on the bench for, oh, for nice. West Ham. Yeah, but he did also add on the end of that. It's more likely they'll be involved with Forest, the Forest yeah. game. But we need them. We really do because this is a massive game. What are we three points behind West Ham? Mm-hmm. Um, if we win, we're getting the passports back out again, aren't we? It's every week. <laughs> <laughs> um, just, but it, it's got to despite be- everything we just said, I'm really looking <laughs> yeah. forward to going to Europe next. <laughs> if we, yeah, if we can't did, wait. we've got four points in these last two games, I would start to believe, but it, it's it's not happening. <laughs> if we get European the thing football. Is, we're, Playing kids we'll we'll be in Europe and we'll have like seven kids on the bench, won't we? We'll have bloody the <laughs> right way up front away at bloody Valencia or something. No, but it's a massive game. Uh, West Ham are the thing is, you look at West Ham, you think they're struggling, but then you look at the table, they're still like they're above. So, like, you know, they're doing something right, and obviously, they've got they're still in Europe. Are they still in Europe or they got knocked out? That's in Europe, man. Yeah. They are still in Europe. Yeah, they're yeah. still in Europe. So they're doing because I know their fans at the t- a few months ago they they wanted Moyes out, didn't they? They were really unhappy. With the way they were playing, um, they like to sit back and hit us on the counter. So I think that will be their tactics on the day. Obviously, they'll sell out their away end, and I think we've got to try and do a kind of a performance as we did against Fulham, just a battling performance with players playing in out of position. And let's just hope we can get over the line on the day and hope Molyneux is up for it. Um, Jack. West Ham, like as Harry said, very, very strange fan base. It always seems like David Moyes is one game away from the the sky falling in and it's it's battle stations he needs to go they are sat sitting pretty in in seventh and like say still in europe but i think if we can almost keep it quiet and a little bit dull in the opening stages so it it turns their away fans because it seems like a pretty easy thing to do yeah i i don't know what to expect sam to be honest really i think as i said the villa game i think we all predicted and it went pretty much according to plan but there was fight in that game and there was a fair amount of fight last night against Burnley as well. So like, you, you just don't know. Like, a, a lot of it comes down to the team selection and who's available. If if there are players coming back, I know you mentioned Dawson and Wang then, you know, that would be brilliant. But again, you can't put too much on players who have just come back to perform. That said, 15 minutes of Cunha last night, we looked a bit better. <laughs> I think it actually, you could tell it, it did help yeah, a little yeah. bit. So it, it might be asking too much of, you know him to start, but I, I'd, I'd much prefer him for like the first fifty-five minutes than for you know just the, the last bit of the second half. But you don't want to rush him back at the same time. But uh, it, it's another one where you just got to go in there with limited expectations. I think really, I think because on paper with the players that are available, and you know they're above us in the table. So the, although it might seem like at the start of the season they're having a terrible season, they're clearly not. But with a bit of success, you're your levels of expectation change amongst the fan base. Even we know that we've seen it at our level. So just got to go at it and give it all we've got with all who's available, really. I know it sounds a bit like, you know, a bit, um, a bit of basic commentary, but um, just, you know, guys are going and got to get beyond the team and just, just see what happens because there has been fight lately, but it all just come down to just, you know, who's available on the day and how, and how we set up. So uh, Dan, do you think it'll be a similar team that started against Villa or one that started against Burnley? Um, Villa was obviously siren goal, uh, Santi Bueno, Kilman, Gomez, Semedo, uh, Jao Gomez, Doyle, Eight Nori, Sarabia, Lamina, Chiwomi. Um, and then obviously last night's 11. Um, I don't know if you want to re- refresh of that one. 
um, Funnily enough, Tomato Kilman Gomez oh, no. Bueno, <laughs> as in uh, the other Bueno. Doherty, Lamina, Jao Gomez, Eight, Nori, Sarabi, and Chuomi. So, funnily enough, I did the We Are West Ham podcast this morning as a oh. way view. And he asked this exact question. And I said, I haven't got a clue, mate. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad they had you on. I'm sure. yeah. um, it could be anything. Um, I think he said I should take my boots. So pretty, much, pretty much sums it up. The only thing with West Ham in the coming weeks, and this is another thing we discussed, they've got a Saturday, Thursday, Sunday, Thursday, Sunday coming up. They've got a oh, load yeah. of fixtures. They've got uh, Leverkusen home and away. So we're the start of a long run for them. So they're going to have to think about squad. Um, they will try and hit us on the break. He said Antonio will be fit and they will have a striker, unlike us. So Wolves going to have possession. We just, as Harry said, it's got to be a Fulham type performance. They had a mad game, didn't they? Last game, was it Newcastle? They were 3 1 up and lost 4 3. Was that Saturday? Yeah, it was the Calvin Phillips gate, wasn't it? Yeah, that was a mad game. So it shows they can concede at least four goals. We can't score, can we? Our goal threat is a bloody fullback. <laughs> <laughs> so true. Uh, Harry, let's do a score prediction. I'm going to be positive 2 1 Wolves. Jack. A, a, a good effort, but a 2 1 defeat. <laughs> you've been so, cl- you, I think you've been on the money. You've been negative lately. Yeah, I've been, I'm, I'm been negative direct. because I've got eyes and I can see. Like, I can watch the game. I can see how poor it is. I can see we've got no players. It, it's just like, it's a recipe for disaster. But I think they're doing, they're actually doing better than my low expectations given the circumstances. <laughs> so you should be happy with that. That's all I see. Uh, Bayless. I'm going to go with the Desmond. And I'm also going to go 2-2. Two, two. And Dan, as your betting news. Do. One minute. Sorry, that's really poor form that I didn't have them ready to go. Um, did a few scorecasts. Odds, there's still a lot of football to be played before we play West Ham, so the odds aren't great at the moment. I imagine they'll probably float around and there'll be some specials out there. Uh, stick with, start with a positive. Ryan Aignori, first goal, obviously. 2-1 Wolves, 60-1, to one, Sam. Oh, not too bad. Like that. Uh, the Desmond, the two-all draw with Chuome scoring first is also 60-1. to one. Bookies haven't mm-hmm. really thought about this game yet. Mm-hmm. Uh Mr. Pessimistic, who also changed his scoreline. Thank you. Uh, Jared Bowen to score first 2-0 West Ham is only 55-1. to one. Oh, God, man. And I've done a Harry Mansell bet. Oh. Harry. Semedo first goal, 4-1 Wolves. Wow. 1,000. It is 1,000 to 1. Is it? Wow. Incredible. Do you know what say? It's never going to happen. It's worth, at the moment, having a few quid on, like, 8 Nori and that, because the book is... And not really realizing where he's playing, so they're still having him as like defender odds. That's why he was yeah, eighty to right. one to get two goals last night. That's why I put a couple of quid on it. So just a little, yeah. When, when I used to work in the bookies for a story of that of that uh, sort of you know similar thing, um, I was uh, it was when under McCarthy in the Premier League. And as you do, you talk about the people in the shop and about football. And it was the day that Wolves were playing at Liverpool, and I said to somebody. Stephen Ward's going to play up front tonight, but his price is a defender. If I was going to have a bet, it'd be one nil. No way, Stephen Ward. No. I didn't back it. I didn't back it. <laughs> oh. it. It was, and it was stupid odds because it, like he was that'd a defender. Huge. But he, like, yeah. But I, I mean, that'd be a massive odds. But I remember Jack. That was a shock start, yeah. weren't it? He did, he weren't really playing up front at the time. That was kind of like a no. A that's the thing. Break, it was wasn't? like because because yeah. I knew with the players av- available and there was like talk or maybe they'll play Ward up front. I was like, that's that's the bet I'd have because he was priced at like you know even to score did, first like sixty six or something. I should remember this, but did Ward start off as a striker then go left back or was it the other way around? Right. No, he started as a striker, went yeah. to a defender. Yeah, that was yeah, weird, we, wasn't it? We brought him yeah. in as a striker. Yeah, that was weird. Yeah. Was it yeah, mm. against someone like Nottingham Forest or something? I think he had to play at left back because somebody and like really good. Michael Gray or some, it just transpired that. Yeah, and to be fair, yeah, I forgot he was there. a striker. Yeah, no, no, we're gonna yeah. get him. Go uh, no, some oh. some good value. There's some value out there if you fancy it. Um, Do you want some ticket news to cheer you all up? Oh, we've got go some on. ticket news. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Coventry City's uh, Wembley tickets go on general sale tomorrow. <laughs> you can fuck off. <laughs> Kick him out. Oh. <sighs> ah, cheers for that, Jack. Can we, go, can we finish at that? Can we go now? I don't want to talk about anything else. 
What, I'm um, joking. Well, hang on, wait, and one more thing. Uh, Wolves have entered into an innovative new partnership with Japanese right. J League team Sean and Belmare, strengthening both clubs' exposure overseas and player and coach development. So Link will focus primarily on academy football with players and coaches from both camps sharing experiences of top level football in different continents and exchanging best practices with each other. And um, Harry, do you think it's another one of those where it's designed to sign some Asian players and hopefully boost some shirt sales? Or, or do you think there's method in the madness? Probably, yeah. It's probably that to try and spot a little gem to boost our awareness over there if we sign him. At least, though, when I first saw this, I thought it was something to do with esports again. So, thankfully, it's not. <laughs> it's probably more of like a grass. But saying that, they don't own them, do they? But So, it's not. It's probably not like grasshoppers. But, yeah, I think it is, mate. It's a little bit of a partnership. Probably swap a few players back and forth for being a youth team. Like, who was that one we signed in January a few years ago? That Kawabi, oh, that yeah. Chinaman, and we never seen him again. So, probably be things like that. Yeah. Um, Bayless, do you think it's a, a good brand message? Is is there a reason for it? I just don't really understand the J League link. I mean, you know, it doesn't seem a, a place where you're going to be fostering brilliant talent. Um, although the Japanese national side isn't, think, isn't too shabby, uh, and you've, you've got the guy at Brighton. Is it? Um, it yeah, football in Toma. football Toma. within Toma. the Toma. Football within a lot of East Asia is getting a lot more popular. Obviously, like Wang and and Son are huge in Korea, and Japan are getting you know Matoma and a few more players. So, I get why they've done it, but it's a marketing exercise. It's got nothing to do with football. Yeah, what do you think I mean by best practice from from? The continent, Jack. What, they have I mean, to what, fill what, that what, much of the <laughs> column. We've, we've got, uh, we've got, we need fifty words on this, on this thing, and that's what Chat GPT I, came. I, out. I actually, I don't even know this story. So, what, what is it? They partnered with this Japanese club um, from why? from their top. Alan Belmer, yeah, uh, who lost to Tokyo Verde two uh, one at home at the weekend, apparently. And they partnered with them for like for what for diet. Uh, fo- the focus exactly the primarily on <laughs> academy football with players and coaches from both camps sharing experiences of top. Uh, they got any strikers? Continents yeah, they got any good strikers. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's probably just going to be a case of yeah, some youth players. They'll probably go over there, swap a few, maybe have a few friendlies against them, that sort of thing. Just building Ooh. a relationship so they can just spot a. So that, like you say, if they if they do get a good player through the academy, we can probably try and swoop it and and snap them up. I'd say that's it, really. Pre-season tour of Japan. I mean, that's always interested me. Good place, That'd be place yeah. to go, potentially. Oh, yeah. See what happens with that one. Um, actually, one more. Um, the, the Express and Star reported that Wolves are safe despite owners' foes and shedding their business interests. Um, they've actually gone into profit. I'm going to start with Bayless on this one because he's the money man. Um, they haven't really been doing great in the last maybe in five to ten years of their Bayless uh, as a, as a hot as a group as opposed to an international. But it seems that their sports arm is being taken a little bit more seriously. If you just sent me the fucking article, I'd have read it. <laughs> I just thought you'd you'd pick it up in the <laughs> FT. <laughs> Blindsided. <laughs> um, it, one of their arms, which was their entertainment arm, wasn't doing particularly great, or one was profitable. I haven't read it. I'll do some research over the weekend, and next week I'll. <laughs> try and give some insight into it to be honest it's a chinese mega company they can either crash wherever they want what do do you think it's good news or bad news jack because i mean there's a lot of comments saying you know there's gonna be no investment in the summer they're probably going to want to sell does this sort of story when um an investment firm which is obviously what they were a huge globally attractive one obviously based in china so a little bit different when it comes to to the rules and and where the money is potentially going or where it comes from yeah, there aren't um, any do, 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 <laughs> yeah they're very true <laughs> uh, do you think that that it's a positive news story or do you think it's uh, that little bit of light that is towards the end of the tunnel which means um, wolves will be sold i mean it's it's positive in terms of you obviously want your owners to be making money but you know there's so many different fingers in so many different pies that Fosun have got that it doesn't mean that money is going to trickle down to us at all and we know they're careful with their money they don't invest in stuff that they seem to be unprofitable but we're probably an exception to that rule actually because we've obviously not been profitable at all lately so uh, yeah I wouldn't mean that it means that we're going to see any movement anywhere to be honest with you we'll probably still be skimping around to try and find three million pounds to sign um, I don't know Kevin Kyle in in, 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 in January <laughs> They could have just deleveraged one arm of something and then that boosted their profits. No idea, unless you get into like the granular, granularity of it. It could just be something to give a headline. What do you reckon, Harry? Um, I don't know, but they always say 
every time you listen to them talk, they always say they're never going to sell us, don't they? They say that it's a, like a lifetime plan. But with the way they're dealing with things from the outside looking in, it doesn't seem that way, does it? But I think you're right. I think they're just a business. They uh, probably ain't got. I mean, they have got a motion in the club, but they just look at the books, don't they? They don't care what most of the fans are saying. They, if they go with a motion, we'll be bust in 10 years. If, if, if you've got a random wall run out the South Bank and said, right, run the club, it'd spunk 100 million in about three windows, and then we'd, we'd be uh, <laughs> we'd be like, uh, we'd be like, what's it called? He went bust, that team up in near Manchester. Berry. We'd be like Berry. Berry. Mm. <laughs> we, could, we could have the glory days of Berry. <laughs> yeah. <definitely. laughs> and on that note, I think it's time to end. Uh, so we'll say goodbye to Harry Mansell. Uh, goodbye. Dan Bayliss. Goodbye. And Jack Williams. Bye. And it is a goodbye from me. Goodbye.